Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope you are doing well. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. Uh, my name is Anna, and I'm a senior marketing specialist at the University of Tartu. And I'm very happy to welcome you to the Alumni Talks 2023 event, this series of webinars. And Alumni Talks is our new series uh, where our fantastic alumni share their stories of studying at the University of Tartu and give a short lecture on topic they selected. And this topic is basically related to their study that they conducted at the University of Tartu, or maybe they are still carrying on this uh, study. Uh, so today with me, I have Ville, uh, who is our alumnus uh, of the master's program in politics and governance in the digital age. And uh, he graduated in 2022. And uh, his work focuses on environmental politics and parties in Central and Eastern Europe. And the topic of his talk today, transitioning from master studies to research in environmental politics. Before giving a floor to Villa, I would like also to mention that you are very welcome to leave your questions during the webinar. Uh, please leave them under Q&A box. Uh, we are going to address these questions at the end of the webinar. If you have any difficulties, please let us also know. We will try to resolve these uh, issues as soon as we can. Uh, we also would like to let you know that we are uh, recording this uh, webinar. So uh, after this webinar, you're going to receive the recording. And uh, I guess that's it from the technical part. And uh, I will give a floor right now to Vila, who is going to share his screen and going to talk about his study. Uh, the floor is yours, Vila. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. I am trying to share my screen, and it looks like it's actually working as well. Yeah, it works. Okay. Great. So yeah, yeah, in, it is true. I'm I'm a graduate of the politics and governance in the digital age program. I graduated last year, although when I actually applied and started studying in the program, the name was something different, and it kind of changed in the middle of my studies. But I I, I think me and the roughly ten other people count as the like 10 people in the world who have now graduated from the new program. Um, I'm doing a PhD at, at the university now in the same institute. And in, in that sense, it might be that my experience in the program and especially after it isn't really uh, that typical or representative, because as far as I know, I'm the only one out of the program who actually continued in academia. Others have went on their, on their, their separate ways, but I'll probably talk about that a little bit more later. So why did I even choose the politics and governance program in the first place? Usually people name the e-governance or the impacts of technology studies and politics when it comes to studying in UT or in Estonia in general, mostly because of the e-voting. And honestly, also the, the Institutes of Political Studies has quite a large proportion of experts and researchers who are focusing on e-governance issues specifically. But for me, uh, the choice really came between Czechia and Estonia. And that's because I did my bachelor's degree in Czechia, in Brno. And, well, in, in the end, there, there, there were some programs in Czechia, in both in Prague and in Brno, that accepted me for master's studies, as well as then the program here in Tartu. And, well, I, I, I got to be very honest that um, at the time, I didn't even know where it thought it was or that it really even existed at the city. But the, the crucial choice in the end was really a financial thing because the, the programs in, in Czechia tended to be more expensive just straight up compared to the Estonian one that offered 
tuition waivers and scholarships to a bunch of students actually in the programs. Uh, otherwise, as well, my BA was actually in international relations, but kind of toward the end of the studies, my interest started to veer towards political science. And then, then the, the programs in Czechia were IR programs, and the program here, politics and governance, is kind of a political science program. But I, I think I'm kind of in a minority in the sense that my interest here stems from just my personal interest in political science that other people, the classmates I had, for example, uh, got into the program because some wanted to get into politics, some wanted to get into kind of civil service, work for ministries to try to make their home countries function better, which is very admirable. And some honestly just wanted to get a degree and a fairly comfortable office job. So for me, the MA at, at Tartu was covered strongly by COVID and the pandemic. Even though it, it's a fairly tightly run program and the, the first year especially is pretty hectic and in, in some regards even infamous for some difficult or demanding courses. And the second year then is a bit less hectic and a little bit less intensive with kind of a lot of space for Erasmus or internships and then the last semester for the thesis. But still the summer of 2020 when I came to Estonia was right in the between of the very first wave in Europe and the second wave. So the first semester actually started in person, although mostly, I, as, I, as far as I remember, we still had masks on in class, but it was kind of a, a lucky in, introduction, I suppose, to the program and the university in that sense. Because then by the second semester, the classes moved completely online. And then the third and fourth semester, they they were kind of <laughs> third semester I was out of the country on Erasmus and the fourth semester focused on thesis. So there were very fairly few classes even to attend anymore at that point. And this has actually come up in another context earlier, but after starting the PhD, I realized that I had barely even been in the building of the Institutes of Political Studies for about a year at that point. Um, a few words though on just generally living and housing, cost of living in Estonia too. If you're interested in studying in Estonia or moving into Estonia to study, then I think my personal tip is to find a spot in the dorms. It's easily the cheapest and probably the easiest way to find a find a place to live in, in the city. The picture on the screen is actually my dorm room that I lived in for about two years and just moved out of fairly recently, like a little over a month ago. Um, I also have included this like rough monthly budget on the slide as well. That was kind of the rough guideline that I had, at least. Although both the room cost and the uh, cost of groceries and general kind of living necessities has increased quite a bit as of late. Because I don't know, you might be aware, but Estonia had the highest rate of inflation in the EU for this almost this whole year now, or well, past year, since it's 23 already. Yeah. Um, usually, otherwise, people mention the climate and the language as being uh, strange or something uh, that needs a little bit time to get used to. But I guess personally, for me, because I was born in Finland, and both the climate and the language are kind of strange and <laughs> might need time to get used to for the foreigners as well. There, so I might be a little bit insulated from those experiences personally. But I mean, it, it's not that bad, really. Like 
just in terms of the Windsor's just layers of clouds and in terms of language also Estonian itself is a small and depending on which language you already speak it might be difficult to learn but honestly Tartu is a student city and most people speak either English or Russian or even both. So what were the studies like? In general full-time studies meant really full-time studies a 30 credit semester which is the aim and the goal or I think the minimum it, it really does kind of correspond to a 40 hour week at least for me though some people worked while doing a master's and that's in especially in hindsight now like that as a very admirable kind of impressive thing for me to do so, although I did work uh, part-time while I was doing my bachelor's degree as well I think the fact that I got the tuition waivers and scholarships for the master's program and actually could study full-time was a huge help but even though it it is full-time studies and fairly demanding that also makes the studies kind of rewarding at least for me and of course there's some free time and hobbies and students events on offer in the city my personal favorite is the university gym the huge facility has anything and everything you would ever need and the price is outrageously cheap for students and otherwise there are also other opportunities for different hobbies there are like painting classes or ceramics classes even things like this and of course the informal just like student gatherings which especially if you're living in the dorms it, it, things like that are going to come up um the classes and the workload in general um it consists of mostly lectures and seminars where lectures are fairly the traditional mode of teaching where the professor or lecturer is teaching about a specific topic and then there might be some time for a q a later on and then also seminars kind of sprinkled in between which mostly consists of with kind of group assignments or discussions or even kind of formal setup debates so the most amount of the work is really just raw reading and writing there's a huge amount of material to go through especially in the first year but at the same time the the institute doesn't seem to mm, be big on these like final exams but instead that we had quite a few of these kind of weekly bi-weekly assignments that would be about like 500 to like 2000 words some courses of course would also have these bigger te tests or kind of like more I don't know traditional setup that would be like a midterm and then a final exam personally it, it took some time to get used to the rhythm of work in UT because the um, studies I did in Czechia were very much focused on those like final exams and midterms and those consisted the most uh, kind of the most proportion of the grade final grade came from those exams but that kind of encourages the cramming culture where at the end of the semester you'll just uh, do these all-night studying sessions but instead here because the assignments are kind of constant or they come more regularly at smaller intervals it does encourage I think students to actually keep on consistently working which might be a little bit healthier but also the results could be actually a little bit better so I will do a quick overview of the kind of semesters that I had so like I said the first and second semesters are very intense there's all the compulsory courses are uh, supposed to be done during the first and the second semesters during the first year there's 
a large amount of reading and there's like I said kind of a constant barrage of smaller assignments you kind of learn a way of reading during or a certain way of reading during this when you're faced with like this amount of just material that you have to go through where you you get pretty good at kind of picking out the main points and the main arguments in larger texts which i think actually is one of the stated goals for the for the like learning goals for the program some of the courses are fairly infamous but they're also compulsory and as compulsory courses they should be completed during the first year which well it, it can generate some sense of like camaraderie among the students but it can also be very scary for some people my personal experience was especially with this um governance course because it's a kind of it was kind of a new topic for me and it, it well you might see it if you come and study here but it, it, it was an intense experience um from the first year i especially actually remember sometimes when i'd be walking back from class to the dorms and i tried to enjoy that 10 minute walk as much as i could because that was technically free time and there was like on some days especially the deadlines were piling up that was the only free time that would actually get during a day but then for the, the third semester, I went on Erasmus and there is specifically space in the program for either for an internship or like a semester abroad. Some classmates got internships in government institutions or ministries or nonprofits or things like that. Personally, I went to Italy, which was a very nice change from the winter in Estonia and Tartu. It kind of ended up working out well for my thesis as well, because the third semester is the time when the thesis topics are supposed to be locked in and you're supposed to also find a supervisor. And my topic ended up being about kind of economic policies of green parties and the University of Bologna, where I uh, spent the semester focuses almost ex exclusively on political economy. For me, that was kind of a lucky coincidence. And maybe there was kind of a the cause effects might also go in the direction that I got interested in political economy while being in Italy, and then I chose that topic. But in general, the program and some of the program managers, they they tend to um encourage people to make purposeful choices in terms of the internship and the Erasmuses. For example, if someone wants to study like right-wing populism in Austria, then it would make sense and it would be easier to get a spot in in in, in a in a university in Austria. But yeah, it's it, it's a the third semester was a, a large significant change from the first year because there actually was time for travel as well. The picture there is from Venice, which was a uh, a nice change from those like appreciating those 10 minute walks from the university to the dorms to change to actually traveling in very cool places and countries if you ever end up in italy i can recommend san marino that's a very very cool place to go to um the fourth semester then was pretty much only focused around the thesis and then there's like there's nothing surprising about that really there's a lot of reading there's some data analysis to do you get some feedback and you edit the thing and then finally submit and defend and stress a lot also <laughs> it's a fairly straightforward kind of semester but still there's work to works to do you know like then the thesis isn't the master's thesis in in reality, no one expects it to be like groundbreaking or anything, but it's still quite a bit of work. So um, after the MA, then uh, some classmates, like they planned in the start, 
they went into civil service or into want to get into politics. I don't know if they actually have established those careers yet. So consulting or whatever, lobbying, data analysis. One guy just recently got a job as a electoral data analytic uh, thing later on. One person actually left the field completely and went back to programming. Or the other choice, which is what I'm doing now, is the PhD, staying in academia. There we go. So I chose to do in the end this PhD or to start the PhD program. I'm now kind of finishing the first semester. So in that sense, I don't know how much insights I actually have into the program, especially considering that it was just recently reformed. But it wasn't really an easy choice for me because they might have to do a lot with the kind of background that I had. Uh, growing up, as a very working class family and like academia didn't come into like the future prospects at all. And actually, I th think me and my older brother are the first generation in the family on either side, mom's or my dad's side, that actually got university degrees. Otherwise, it's a long line of farming and manual labor. And I was actually, I dropped out of high school for a little bit. And I ended up getting the high school diploma from like a night school while I was working in a warehouse. But somehow when I actually got into university in Czechia for the bachelor's degree, it like kind of something just kind of clicked, I suppose, at that point. And I'm still doing the same thing. But I think on the basis of this kind of background where I'm more used to manual labor and academia has kind of, it still appears to me as kind of a strange foreign world. I had kind of a culture shock when I first started that PhD, which is kind of interesting to think about really, because I've lived in a few countries and I've never really had that much of a culture shock. But then it, then it finally happened when I'm in the country and city I've lived in for a few years already, but I'm just in a little bit different position. Like it, it feels strange that suddenly like something changed and they're paying me to do this now. Like for five years, I was like living on minimum wage or less than minimum wage. And now like, I, I don't feel any different, but you know, suddenly someone decided to actually pay me money and give me vacation days and health insurance. But speaking of that, actually, for the actually finally choosing to do the or applying for the PhD program, the salary and the vacation days and the health insurance were a fairly big draw. The doctoral program was just recently reformed in a way that the uh, PhD students are also employees of the university, where in the past, the PhD students had to live off of stipends or uh, participation in research projects, for example. Now we are also, we are students, but we are also junior research fellows. That comes with a certain set of different um, responsibilities and there's kind of a, the setup is a little bit different, but all in all, I think that's a very positive change because at least for me, it's actually made it possible to, you know, realistic to really do the PhD. So I think it was a huge advantage really that I did my MA at Schütte, which is the, the Johann Schütte Institute of Political Studies, because on one hand, the admission committee looks for people whose research interests align well with the interests of the institutes. And since I already spent two years here, and honestly, they, they shaped my interests 
like directly the, the members of the admission committee shaped my interest. It, it was a pretty easy fit in that sense. But also, I, because I'd been in the courses of the people who were in the admission committee, I kind of knew what kind of skills and competencies they were looking for. But also on the flip side, that also meant that the committee kind of knew me. So I was a known quantity for them and there weren't any big surprises. And I think a benefit was also the fact that I already lived in Tartu and I didn't have any plans on leaving either. But then, of course, the actual research plan and the interview mattered as well. Like, I had to do well on those. But I think it would be a little bit naive to think that those other kind of environmental factors, I guess, those structural factors, they didn't make a difference too. I guess one thing as well was that I've continued with the same supervisor that I had for the master's thesis. So in that sense as well, it's the, the, the change between a master's student and a PhD student, while the supervisor remained the same, has been fairly smooth and painless. Whereas I can imagine that for someone who's coming from another university or country to work with a completely new people, the transition might take a little bit more time than maybe it did for me. I don't know. I, that's something that time will really tell later on. Um, the dissertation topic that I had grew out of the coursework during the masters. I, there was a course on it's like electoral behavior or party politics, something like that. The name of the course might be a little bit different by now. But in it, in, during that course, um, the, the kind of the, the question of Green Party success or lack thereof in post-communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe popped into my head at some point. And that led me to do a few assignments for that class where I was trying to look into that question. And there is some research done on that specific question. But the thing about it is that the existing research tends to take a view that, um, well, the, ex the explanations are individual level. They focus on the values of voters. So basically the existing argument goes that where Green parties have a larger potential voter base in northern northern and western Europe. That same voter base doesn't exist to the same extent in post-communist countries. But my MA thesis then tried to look at this question from the point of view of parties, because it's, it is kind of it's to be expected that parties have a role to play in their own success. It would be a little bit simplistic to assume that they wouldn't. But it turns out that, and this is probably why there hasn't been a lot of research on this topic on the point of view of parties, is that there really is fairly little data available, which obviously understandably makes the research a little bit difficult to actually do. Otherwise, also, I think environmentalism, because of climate change, had been on my mind, like probably it had been for others. And I think that had its effect as well on why I actually got interested into green parties. Like it's not all like super theoretical and complicated, sophisticated stuff. A part of it is simply just that I feel very anxious about climate change in general. In that way, I guess also the doing trying to do research on this topic is kind. Of, it, it has a personal level, so it has well in that sense. 
But like I said, um, my position now then as a graduate of the program of the MA program and a PhD student is both as a student, but also as a junior research fellow and employee in the, in the institute. And as a student, nothing much has really changed. There are still some courses to complete. I, there's still a bunch of reading and writing that I need to do. And obviously there's some thinking that comes along with the reading and writing. In terms of courses, for example, I'm, I'm planning on taking a master's level course just this next semester. Um, but mostly everything still revolves around the dissertation and the, the doctoral thesis. But there is also some time for personal development. And this is kind of an, at least it was an interesting point to me when I was looking at the formal listed uh, learning goals of the doctoral program. That there is, there are some difficult to quantify, but there are some requirements for personal developments as well. Mostly they relate to things like learning how to teach and supervise students, but they also have space for learning languages or just kind of like spending some time to do some self-reflection and trying to see what kind of things could be uh, improved in the context of the course, which that's kind of a rare thing really to me that a job as a profession, even a, a part of your responsibility is to actually develop as a person. But yeah, as, as a student, it's reading, writing some courses and we are all of the PhD students accountable to the senior staff still. So we submit our essays and try to defend our arguments and are kind of under the constant feedback of uh, professors and lecturers, especially the specialty leaders and all the kind of senior staff of the institute and our supervisors. But then also as an employee, we are treated as colleagues and not students, which sometimes feels strange, this kind of dual position. It's a very new thing for everyone, I think. So that it might take some time for there, for there to kind of uh, be this kind of institutional knowledge about what the position of the PhD students in the reform program really is. But still, in the employment contract, the workload is mostly focused on the dissertation, unsurprisingly. It's actually laid out in a way that 80% of my workload is supposed to be directly focused around the PhD thesis and up to 20% is other tasks. And those other tasks then include, for example, being a teaching assistant in courses. And with that comes some administrative work. There can be these kind of longer term research projects that have outside funding going on, which most professors have going on at some points or another, I think. And there, there can be some actual research work involved in those for the PhD students as well, but it can be also more administrative work. Um, but personally, the biggest thing biggest change from this employee status was the access to resources and the access to experts. Because as a student, you just do the courses, do the readings, uh, you know, you, you have a fairly simple job to do. But as an employee, also partly because we have this responsibility to actually develop our skills and competencies we have access to resources potentially to funding so we can go to conferences 
try to find out what's going on in the field or to, for example, attend method schools. For example, I have coming up one method school where basically I'm just going to be learning math and statistics. And to try to do that without the university resources would be practically impossible. Then in terms of the access to experts, um, we were told at one point that academia lives off criticism. And that <laughs> seems to be a very accurate description of how things work. So in, in that sense, the access to experts is more access to criticism and feedback than you had as a student, which it might sound a little bit funny, I guess, that like one of the biggest changes and the biggest like positives of being a research fellow at the university is that people get to criticize my work more, but really it's never personal. It's always about trying to do better work. And in the end, I know everyone benefits from the feedback and the discussion that goes on. And since I've been talking about my work after the graduation and what I've been doing now, I, I hope you'll let me indulge a little bit more and I can actually describe shortly what the dissertation is about because that is after all most of what I'm doing these days. So I continued with the same topic of environmental politics in Central and Eastern Europe and I'm still trying to uh, explain the party's position when it comes to the well the success of the, those those parties. The Dissertations can be done in two different ways, broadly speaking. The first one is kind of the classic monograph style, where you just basically write a short book about a very specific topic, and then you try to defend it after ideally four years, sometimes a little bit longer. The other way of doing things is what I'm doing. And that's an article-based dissertation. Basically, the idea is to, instead of writing a one very long kind of story or argument, I'm going to try to publish three journal articles that will make up the whole of the dissertation. The first one is about figuring out a new measurement for environmental policies. Because like I mentioned earlier, there's kind of a problem with the data on green parties and their policies in that there's very little, little data on green parties in general and the existing measurements of environmental policies are fairly simplistic to put it shortly. And they tend to only measure for the presence or non-presence of environmentalism among or within the party policies. So right now I'm trying to figure out different dimensions or different ways of trying to measure environmental policies. Maybe, maybe as an example, it could be nice and like illustrative to mentioned, for example, the way economic policies can be measured, like there can be left, right dimensions. There can be how and what kind of interventions the state does to policies, uh, to economies and so on. So that's what I'm working on right now. The future plan then for the rest of the articles then uh, is first or second to figure out what kind of policies impact the electoral success of green parties the most. 
So if it is true that parties play a significant role in their own success, then it would kind of stand to reason that different combinations of policies in different contexts would be either less or more successful. So I'd like to find out what kind of policies tend to be successful for green parties in general, and especially in the uh, post-communist region. The last article would be about the effects of socialist or communist socialization on Green Party choice. So basically the idea would be that to test whether there is a lasting effect on how people do or don't vote for Green parties based on the fact that either they grew up to be adults under communism or they partially grew up into like some teenage years under communism or if they were completely born after the, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and the communist bloc in Europe. Yeah, that basically covers the whole thing of what I wanted to talk about. Really shortly, it's kind of been a fairly long road to get here, it feels like. There's been, since 2017, quite a few once-in-a-lifetime events, it seems like. But I'm very thankful that I am here to Karto. It's a pretty cute town, and the university has been very good to me. But at the same time, <laughs> why I still keep on studying, I, I might honestly just be a masochist. I don't know why I keep on doing this. But no, it's it's not that bad. I'm having a good time, so I think it's all good. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Villa, for taking us during your study journey from your master's program to a PhD program and uh, your current position of a junior fellow uh, researcher. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, and now I guess it's time to open our Q&A session. We have quite some questions that arrive to our uh, uh, question and answer box. Uh, so the first question is, is the fourth semester is uh, uh, for the thesis work? Yeah, I think as far as the program plan goes, it is pretty much completely devoted to the thesis. But I think if a few people had other courses going on in the meantime as well. Some people were more ambitious about it than others. I, I had like a Russian course on the side and that's all. But some other people would have like three, four courses. But I think that's, that, that's very ambitious, to say the least. Thank you so much. Our next question is, I'm willing to apply for a master's course and there are several questions. So first question, what would be your tips and things that I should keep in mind? And the second one is work experience necessary for doing masters in politics and governance in digital age. Mm. Yeah, in, in terms of tips for the I'm assuming for the application process. As far as I remember, the motivation letter mattered quite a lot. So if you can try to, as with like any job application, pretty much, if you can try to think of very specific examples and be like very even like forceful and clear about them when you write about it, it will probably make the admission committee like you more because they don't have to try to read between the lines of of the motivation letter. In in terms of the work experience, no, it's not necessary. It's definitely a positive. Um, a bunch of my classmates did have varying work experience, either in, on, in doing volunteering or in NGOs or even in some EU institutions. But for example, I didn't have really any work experience in the field. The part-time job I had 
while I was doing the bachelor's was just project management, for example. Thank you so much for your tips and for uh, sharing your personal experience. Uh, uh, the next question is actually uh, contains uh, four questions with four questions. So I will divide it into four. The first question, uh, will the graduate be able to design and administer an e-voting process? If yes, which part of the voting process he or she will be ready to cover administrative versus coding blockchain? Oh, I can do it. Okay. Um, that's kind of a difficult question to answer, really. First of all, my expertise isn't in the governance field. I'm doing comparative politics. But in, in general, I think very varying topics of thesis are acceptable and would probably play well. Any like e-voting topic, it would be probably a fairly good choice because like <laughs> this is the place to do it really. There's plenty of expertise to uh, support that kind of ambition or goals. But um, in, in general, the thesis should have some kind of uh, like added value, um, academically speaking. So if the idea is to purely just do some kind of like administrative innovation, it could work as a governance kind of thing. Or if there's coding that you want to do, then there probably should be something else alongside it as well. But like I said, I'm not an expert in e-governance, so don't take my word for it. So, uh, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the second question is, are coding skills necessary for a prospective student? If yes, what the programming language the student must be prepared to master? No, no, coding skills aren't necessary at all, but in terms of a programming language, I think R is the most important one to use. And that's mostly, that's what I've been doing. And that's what mostly used for like a statistical analysis. Otherwise, if someone wants to get deeper into programming, then Python probably would be a pretty good choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, the third question, what book would you recommend this in social science methodology? Oh boy, okay, well, <laughs> oh, well, the, the big classic is um, King Keohane and Verbas. It's uh, in 1994, I think it was called um, Designing Social Science Inquiry or something along those lines. That's the big classic, really. And there are as, as you might expect, there's an endless amount of literature on methodology. And really, it depends on whether we're talking about quantitative, qualitative, or interpretive, and then kind of what kind of methods really in the end. But I think kind of the, the big classic starting point is that KKV 1994 book, Social Science Inquiry. Thank you so much. And the last question, is it possible to work part-time in Estonia during the study? Yeah, yeah, sure. And I think, like I mentioned, I had classmates who studied part-time during the study as well. A lot of people seem to do this uh, food delivery stuff. And then I had a few people who were teaching English alongside the studies. Oh, um, not that I had a few people, like I know a few people who did this. They seem to be the most popular choices. Mm -hmm. If I may add, add then uh, it's allowed to work also full time. There is no restriction about working hours, but of course the study should come first because the studies are the most important uh, when you're gaining your master's degree. All right, I guess we are gonna take our last question. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all of them, uh, but uh, there is a question about the interview. If, is there an interview for a master's program? And if yes, can you give some insights of the interview? Yeah, that's actually kind of a fun question because it seems to depend on the program a little bit. The program that I applied for, the, the politics and governance one, I don't think they actually did interviews, at least consistently. 
they might have had some specific questions for specific applicants that they then called in for an interview. But for example, from what I remember, at least most people in the international relations program were actually pulled in for an interview. Mm -hmm. I just also had a quick look. So there is an interview for this upcoming intake. Uh, so it is mm -hmm. compulsory motivation letter and an interview. Uh, so I guess uh, if you would like to know more about that, that we will have a private consultation with program managers. So you would be able to ask more about that. Okay, I guess uh, we can take one last question because we still have a few more minutes. Uh, so uh, uh, let's uh, uh, take this question. Could you name a course which was the most beneficial for you and that you would definitely recommend for future students at this program? Mm -hmm. I probably would have to go with the electoral behavior course that I mentioned earlier that kind of ended up generating the PhD dissertation idea that I am now working on. But otherwise, that was also a pretty fun course to take. As far as I remember, though, right now in the uh, reformed or reformed kind of new version of the program, it's actually a compulsory course. It's, <laughs> if, if you're in the program, you're going to take it anyway. Oh, if out of optional ones. Oh, no, I think that's actually also a mandatory one now. There's a course on political culture. That was a lot of fun, but that might be compulsory now as well. Well, <laughs> useless answer. <laughs> I tried. There is also a very related question to that. Would you advise a thesis topic related to the energy transition or political economy or the energy? Absolutely, totally. I mean, that would be a great topic. The, the, I wonder, though, if in the Schütze Institute there is a lot of actual expertise on energy security. At least no one comes to mind off the top of my head. Tallinn might be a better option, honestly, for that, as much as I'm trying to promote UT here. Yeah, thank you so much. I guess, unfortunately, we have to wrap up our webinar. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today, for asking your questions. And uh, very big thank to you, Villa, for your presentation, for sharing your personal experience and telling your life story from a master's degree to current PhD position that you have at the University of Tartu. Uh, before we end this webinar, I would like also to invite you to apply. So if you're interested in master's program in politics and uh, governance in digital age, the application process is open now and you can apply uh, before March 15th. Uh, and also, uh, we are going to follow up with the recording of this webinar and there are going to be also virtual meetings with program directors where you can also ask uh, some specific questions about the program. So we are going to send you all of this information as well over the email. Uh, thank you so much for being today with us. Thank you so much, Rila, and I really hope to see you soon.